Hello and welcome, Bujeri Gamaru from the Gadigal Lands in Sydney. Welcome to our special hypothetical discussion where we break out our quantum crystal balls to look 10 years down the track for a vision of technology in the future. I'm Simon Thompson, editor of StartupDaily.net, and I'll be your moderator for our microthetical brought to you in partnership with Microsoft, helping startups and digital companies build for the future. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we broadcast from the Gadigal lands in Sydney, and I acknowledge the people of the Eora Nation and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Now, we have a panel of some of the smartest people in technology, blockchain, cryptocurrency, startups, and climate tech to share their vision of the future over the next 45 minutes, and I'd like to introduce them to you. Mick Labinskis is the founder of Climate Salad and one of Australia's most experienced and pioneering investors and startup advisors. Mick is now a climate tech advisor and angel investor in Cecil Earth, Ripe Robotics, Acure, Elio Startmate and Energy Lab. He is a co-founder of Pollinizer and Muradi and the author of She's Building a Robot. If you've got young girls and looking for Christmas presents, I can thoroughly recommend that book. He's also a football player uh, with three kids and a surfer. Great to have Mick along. Carolyn Bauer is the CEO of BTC Markets, the largest Australian digital asset exchange. Carolyn was the founder of Bowler PR, the first fintech PR agency in Asia with offices in Singapore and Melbourne. She has worked in financial services since 2004, or further back than we're going forward, and both in Europe and in the Asia Pacific region. Sarah Carney is the Chief Technology Officer of the Enterprise Commercial Team at Microsoft Australia. Sarah has worked with Microsoft for six years and is responsible for Microsoft's industry strategy for Australia's largest commercial enterprises. In her spare time, she is a passionate creator of abandoned art, we'll try and get into that later, and attempts not to kill her cacti collection. We'll give her some tips along the way as well. And Professor Yang Zhang is the Dean of Digital Research and Innovation Capability Platform at Swinburne University of Technology. His research interests include cybersecurity, which covers network and system security, data analytics, distributed systems, and networking. He is also leading the blockchain initiatives at Swinburne. He has published more than 300 research papers in many international journals and conferences. He is also the editor-in-chief of the Springer Briefs on cybersecurity systems and networks. So welcome all to my panellists and thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. It's great to have you here for our microthetical. Now, I want everyone to turn their minds forward to the year 2030. U.S. President Mark Trumpabot is halfway through the first term as U.S. President. He's the first U.S. leader elected on a ballot held solely on social media. Only American citizens who are registered users of the platform, Waybook, are allowed to vote, casting a thumbs up like in red or blue for the nation's 48th president. And he won by a surprising 99.9% .9 of the votes. But right now, there's a lot on his meta plate. China and India are now global tech superpowers, along with New Zealand, home to 90% of the world's top venture capital investors. African nations have collaborated to form their own trading bloc uh, and have also created their own EU-style cryptocurrency, AfriCoin, for global trade. But meantime, Elon Stark is preparing to leave Earth for good and is selling all of the cryptocurrency that made him the world's first trillionaire. Markets are nervous and ETFs are plunging, said mum and dad millionaires broke in a crash known as Black DeFi. Stark's parting gift is a free electric car to anyone who lost money buying Dogecoin over the last decade. Well, the United Nations Ethical AI Council is at loggerheads, while several countries have been accused of abusing the UN Charter of Digital Human Rights. Government services now use artificial intelligence now layered across 25 years of social media data for all the world's citizens. And a centralised data bank is tracking their locations minute by minute. The world agreed at COP28 to shut down the existing blockchain because it's 
of its energy consumptions and other shortages have begun to emerge with the world now running out of lithium after it's revealed that Elon Stark has been stockpiling it on the moon over the last five years. And war has broken out with the rogue nation, the United Republic of Revol, launching cyber attacks on the US, supported by Eastern European cyber criminals hired on the NASDAQ listed gig economy marketplace, Hacktasker. Well, the digital natives are now in their prime and at the peak of their powers, economically and politically, mandating a digital life for all citizens. So how crazy is this vision? And given that the Australian government has identified unknown technologies as a solution to climate change, is that going to happen, Nick Lubinskis? How much optimism do you have about the world in 2030? Over to you, Mick. Well, after that intro, Simon, uh, I, uh, I've got to go and process that with uh, an entire weekend and, um, and uh, possibly some sleep and meditation. But it's easy to be really overwhelmed and feel like some of these things are insurmountable. We, we're definitely at a crossroads, you know, a, a number of major uh, issues in humanity. Um, and and I, sometimes I do have climate anxiety in what I do as a dad of three kids. But also what I've seen in the last two years is a, is a massive increase in the belief of people understanding these problems and committing to go to solve them. We are at a time where I have the privilege of being able to choose purpose as well as, um, as, uh, as a part of my mission. And, um, and I think a lot of other people have, and, and those people are collaborating. And we saw the response to COVID-19 if the world can collaborate with the same sense of urgency around these big issues, then uh, then I am really optimistic and positive. And it doesn't need the whole world to do it. We, we know that it's a passionate small group of people that has the biggest impact. And I think we have that, that group uh, at work and um, working together to solve those now, which is really exciting. So we do have a tendency to overestimate the short term, underestimate the long term. I'm not quite sure <laughs> which of those that you just put out there. I think you've got a safe bet that some of them are going to come true. Uh, I certainly hope that that um, you know, we we can uh, we can move the move the needle on a, on a lot of these big issues. And I really do believe that we can actually significantly improve inequality and lift millions and millions and millions more people out of poverty um, by creating better systems. Um, I think we can we can go much faster with gender equality and broader diversity and inclusion. We should absolutely be getting to a point where we have more w women in leadership of, of all organisations and entrepreneurship, innovation and venture capital. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, but I think the momentum is, is, is shifting and, and hopefully we'll get the same exponential growth we got in, in computer systems that we get in these social systems. And I think that can flow through to health, through education. Um, and, and into an area that I'm massively passionate about because if we don't solve it, we, we, there's no point of anything else around living sustainably with our climate. And I think by, by 2030, we can. We can be at 90% renewable energy. We can be, be at well past 50% of all vehicles being electric vehicles. Um, and we can embrace this amazing, crazy new wild technology for carbon sinks called trees and, and look after them. Uh, and that's in our home gardens, in our parks, in our national parks, in our rainforests, in our oceans, uh, in terms of coral and, and kelp. Uh, you know, all these things we know we just need to need to execute on them. And I do believe we have the team of people who are passionate, collaborating, collaborating on them to solve them. So I um, it's it's going to be hard, but we can do it. Sarah Carney from Microsoft, you're working for one of the great technology companies of the world, working with some of Australia's largest companies in the enterprise space. As you develop ideas and innovation and technology, tell us about your optimism for 2030 and what we could achieve over the next decade. Thanks, Simon. Well, you talked a little bit about the metaverse, and I think, you know, People are in two minds about it. Do we want to live in this virtual world where you know, we're connecting via headsets or not? But we can see it's moving that way already. We've spent the last two years doing everything on Zoom or Teams, you know, close to my heart. Um, so the metaverse isn't a stretch beyond that, really. It's that opportunity to try and create real interaction. And so I'm seeing organisations already using this in certain ways. We've seen it through the pandemic where people are building digital twins of things. And that's effectively... What the metaverse is is bringing that reality into your virtual world and mel melding the two together in some you know, mixed reality way so that part of your scenario definitely i can see already emerging um, and coming forward 
but you, know, you talked about space and I think there's a really nice link into what Mick's talking about, which is the piece I don't think anyone's thinking about at the moment is how do we protect space as the next environmental frontier? Um, you know, there are so many space environmental issues with space debris. We've seen all the satellite launches. They have a finite life. Um, so I think that one's going to be a really interesting one out of your scenarios there about sending lithium to the moon. Um, but, you know, how safe is space going to be? How much further can we take it? Um, you know, I think that's going to be an interesting challenge out of your scenario. Uh, Professor Zhang, uh, great to have you on. You're working in a space where we see a lot of collaboration, some of it good, some of it malevolent, of course, when it comes to things like cyber hacking. What's your view on how technology will start to evolve over the next decade? And in some of the areas that you're working in, where will you, we see the greatest advances? We have seen uh, a lot of uh, discussion on digital transformation uh, in the recent years. We have seen the, our traditional work has been transformed by the digital technologies, such as uh, the uh, Internet of Things, uh, cyber physical systems, um, blockchain, AI, and many others. So um, we, we can see that our life has been uh, changed a lot. And uh, down the track, we will see continue seeing the, this, this trending. Uh, so um, I think it, it is important to always remember the technologies can change the world, but we should use the technology wisely. So I'm a fan of technology for social good. So um, um, I believe that we should use the um, technologies responsibly and uh, we should use the technology wisely. So there are a few angles that we should pay attention to. Uh, one issue is about uh, security. So uh, we should uh, notice that uh, the hackers are constantly use the, um, the uh, cyber vulnerabilities to launch their attack. And uh, we, we need to make sure the society is safe and secure. So that's number one. And the second is about privacy. Um, we, we all care about our privacy and uh, people do care about uh, their um, bank uh, information, uh, like their personal information, their sensitive information. And uh, while we are caring about those uh, sensitive information, we also need to think about uh, how we define the privacy. It, it could be a uh, could be changing. Down the track, say in 2030, uh, the definition of privacy could be could be different from now. So uh, I guess uh, we should all uh, thinking about how we use the technologies responsibly. Uh, however, also think about the sustainable sustainability down the track. Carolyn Bowler from BTC Markets. I mean, the theme that's already emerging is one of collaboration. I would argue the cryptocurrencies and the blockchain itself has been about collaboration. It's formed so many communities along the way. And of course, now it's spread into the broader mainstream. What's your view on the potential of collaboration to solve some of the big issues that we are addressing? Well, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, well, I think that throughout human history, we've seen the impact and the power of collaboration when groups of humans get together to try and transform and change the world. And I think that's probably a lot of the, the spirit that was behind the creation of Bitcoin and, and, and created the behemoth that is, that is blockchain. So that spirit of collaboration, that spirit of kind of autonomy, that, that spirit of, of transformation and change and using technology for good, um, as Professor has kind of spoken about. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged to see not just the use cases of blockchain technology, but the speed at which this is catching fire across the world. I was at a, an industry event here in Sydney on, on Monday where um, a group of very senior members of our financial services industry all spoke um, at, at their respective panels and, and uh, speaker times around the use cases of crypto and blockchain. And even more significantly spoke about um, the uses of DAOs as organizations within, within our economies and social structures. These are all very transformative discussions to be having and, and, and at a speed. I think for us who work in the industry, you know, we always feel like everyone else is playing catch up and can they, can, you know, can they move, move along a bit quicker? But I think we don't then give credit to the people who are moving along and, and coming, you know, tackling with these big, big issues, these big technology discussions well outside their comfort zone um, and at, at a good clip. So I think that they're, you know, kind of to echo a lot of, of the other comments 
I'm certainly heartened for the future and certainly heartened by this increased collaboration that we're seeing, not just locally, not just nationally, but, but internationally as well. Now, in the crypto space and, of course, blockchain as well, I painted a picture whereby sort of, you know, the, uh, the blockchain we have now was outlawed because of energy consumption. It's one of those issues that's come up along the way. I know, Young, you believe that there will be an evolution of the blockchain over the next few years, and we may even have blockchain 2.0 along the way. I want to throw this open to all of you in terms of can we see collaborations around things like nations banding together to create their own cryptocurrencies like an AfriCoin and, and what will happen with the blockchain? We know that the idea itself is a great one and has enormous potential, but will it evolve quite quickly over the next decade? Well, if I may, just, just on a couple of the points there, when we're talking about the energy use of, of blockchain, it, it shifts the responsibility away from the energy creators onto the energy users. And I don't think that that's the correct framing of any discussions around energy um, energy use. It really sh should be sitting with the energy producers themselves. They're the ones that create the source of the energy. They're the ones that we need to speak to to make those changes through. I mean, notwithstanding you know, proof of work, the initial um, proof of concept that was consensus rather mechanism that was used for the Bitcoin blockchain. Absolutely, the energy consumption there is quite extensive. But energy can't be destroyed. It can only change from one form to the next. So we need to take it back a step. We need to look at the initial uh, energy source and clean it up there. Plus the industry itself is moving forward with different concepts like proof of stake, which use different um, amounts of energy and a different form of consensus mechanism, which differs from, from proof of work. So, so that's my thoughts on the energy piece. But just when you're talking about potentially nations coming together and, uh, and creating their own currency, that's the US dollar, that's the euro, that's the Australian dollar. It's, you know, that's any large group of people coming together and collectively saying, okay, we're going to use this um, effectively figment of our imagination to, to represent something. And that's what human history has done continuously. It's, you know, at one point it was conch shells that we used. Um, and we've always reiterated and iterated again on what we think of currency. So, you know, talking about the AfriCoin, that seems quite a logical, logical thing for me. Um, and something like a collective stable coin in whatever form it will take. Uh, absolutely, and particularly to go back to Sarah's point about the metaverse and you know, the, where this could all go, you, the use of something like cryptocurrencies and NFTs within that world makes complete sense for, the, say, the next 15 to 20 years, and then after that, all bets are off. Young, I know you're a believer in the evolution in this space. Just tell us a little bit about your picture on that front. Yeah, uh, I think the blockchain created a, uh, a chance parent and also a trustable environment for everyone. So um, everyone share their information uh, on this platform and, uh, and, and this gives us uh, some uh, confidence on trust. So I think that's the uh, value of blockchain. Um, but currently uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, technology has some uh, issues of, uh, of um, uh, energy consumption. And the, the key cause is actually on the uh, consensus mechanism. So which means um, the, the compute, all the computers uh, needs to do a lot of computation and the computation can some, uh, consume a lot of energy. So that's the problem. So I, I guess uh, in the future, there will be some new technologies that can solve the problem. Because uh, you know, this is a, a human society. Uh, we will find ways to reduce the cost uh, no matter uh, what ki kind of technologies we can use. So uh, eventually, I guess there will be some new generation of blockchain. It could be named as uh, blockchain 4.0, blockchain uh, 5.0, 5 .5 uh, but uh, I guess maybe in the future, it could have a new name, just like a meta metaverse. Uh, it's a new name for Facebook, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, Mick, um, are you keen on something like an Enviro coin, a net zero coin, so that everyone working in that space in terms of tackling climate change can create their own cryptocurrency and help sort of fund and progress the ideas and find the investors and supporters to help them achieve it? Yeah, I was just going to follow up on something that Caroline said yeah. in terms of the, the onus of responsibility or part of it being back on the energy companies to create good energy. But I think we often really underestimate our own uh, and power as individuals, as companies, uh, as investors in, in whatever crypto you choose. 
um, to actually choose things that are more sustainable. I, I think we, at times we've been passive in systems like political systems, uh, organisation systems and, and financial systems. And, and I think that's to be, been to the detriment, detriment of most people. And I actually think now a lot of the power is back with consumers to say, you, you choose the pro product which has sustainable packaging, you choose the cryptocurrency, which is actually more sustainable for the planet. Um, people choosing to work uh, for companies that actually are sustainable and mission driven. So I, I don't think everything, uh, there may be thousands of cryptocurrencies. I think they'll eventually consolidate into, into something more simple and, and global. And, and the, the exciting and hard thing about platforms is, um, is until they're actually formed and you can build upon them, we actually really don't know about their full applications. And that's been the way for technology for a very long time. It you know it took a lot longer for the, for people to build on those on software platforms, a lot longer to build on mobile application platforms, and I think the same with the things like these new currency plat platforms um, and decentralized finance is uh, we we don't know yet. We haven't actually fully unleashed the creativity of a, of a thousand uh, entrepreneurs and innovators uh, on that space to actually go and create these new models. But what I really 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 hope is that they do that with not purely profit motive in mind. They do that with sustainability, which includes equality, inclusion and diversity, in, and includes um, respecting the environment. So I don't think we need a specific one, but I think that the, the, the one that actually completely and utterly is in line with sustainability has um, the greatest chance, it certainly gets my vote. Sarah, as you talk with your clients in the enterprise space, do you have a lot of conversations around things like the blockchain and perhaps cryptocurrencies, but also that sense that, you know, there is this over the horizon planning that companies want to be engaged with and collaborating with various sectors? Yeah, definitely. And I think we're seeing a trend, particularly in traditional financial services, to have a look at how they can reform banking processes and make you know, the bank of the future is what they're looking at. So definitely, um, you know, cryptocurrency, I think we can see this is the way the world's moving. It's just the stability of it, the ability of people to actually hold on to it. So I see the benefit of it. Um, yeah, so blockchain, definitely lots of different uses we're seeing in that space as well as to how people are looking to use that to secure their enterprise assets and how they can take that forward as part of their business model. Um, but I would love to, if I can have a moment to talk a little bit about, you suggested Hacktasker as this thing in the future, um, but it already exists. And what I think is really interesting is, you know, Hackers for Hire has seen a huge rise over the last you know, couple of years. You know, we've seen a growth in endpoints that could be compromised and therefore a growth in hacking of those endpoints. Um, so Hackers for Hire is already out there. But I think the thing that I am really heartened by is the rate, you know, the increase we're seeing in white hats or ethical hackers um, trying to look at how they can stop the hack before it even happens. Um, so I think it's just you you raised hack tasker in your scenario, and I just thought that was a really interesting you know, pivot on that, which is it almost exists in the the dark web already, um, but there is also a really good side of that. Well, I do want to tackle the cybersecurity issue because, of course, it's been a big theme the last couple of years. And I think it's going to be one of the major tensions of our time, especially as our lives do move completely online. And here's a scenario, you know, the Australian government right now is looking at spending tens of billions of dollars on nuclear submarines that will deliver sort of 20 plus years down the track. Should we take that money out of our defence capability and invest it into the cybersecurity side? And is that where our wars are going to be fought and where we should be spending our money rather than on really large hardware that goes bang? All of you. Uh, I don't know how much, uh, um, how much money the Australian government is going to invest. Uh, I mean, in, in, in the whole, um, but I, I think it is definitely important to invest something on cybersecurity. So uh, we have seen uh, the investment from the government on setting up uh, different uh, cybersecurity operation centers and also uh, supporting some uh, IND activities um, to those um, uh, research institutions. I think that is really good, um, but I think um, we might not um, recognize the important uh, importance uh, of cybersecurity uh, at this time because the 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 movement of the technology is very fast. So uh, we 
we might think that uh, at this stage, uh, security is, is sufficient. Uh, however, in, in the next five years, uh, what we, we are currently doing is actually not sufficient. Um, the hackers can always use the uh, software vulnerabilities to launch their attacks against different things. So um, it is always uh, important to remember that we need to get prepared for the future attacks and uh, utilize different technologies such as machine learning, deep learning, and uh, some software-based uh, technologies to deal with the, the future attacks. So um, I think it, it is uh, uh, important to have some uh, thinking about the uh, investment uh, from different angles. You know, uh, uh, energy is a very important um, topic uh, at this age uh, because we, we, we should all think about the sustainability and we also need to think about the uh, security side, uh, why we need to uh, make sure our society is uh, secure and uh, how we can make sure the uh, the operation of the whole society is uh, is uh, is safe. So uh, I guess that that is important. Caroline, I want to ask in terms of the blockchain and the role it would play in a scenario like this, and then also issues around data privacy and and all of that space, because of course we are going to be awash with data. But some of a lot of it will need to be protected. Can the blockchain be an important part of that protection? Well, actually, with a blockchain, the, the, the secret source is the fact that it is so transparent and is, mm -hmm. it is so open. So in, in some regards, mm -hmm. it almost takes away the sting of the threat by its very nature. Um, but, but, you know, obviously the need for data protection is something that increasingly we're all vulnerable to. Um, and I probably agree with, again with the, with the professor's comments around, you know, the investment seems to happen now. And I probably also wouldn't frame it as a binary choice between just, you know, whether we go for it for the submarines or whether we go look at investments in cybersecurity. Um, I, what I would suggest in some cases is that the need for this digital hygiene, if I can use the, the parlance of the industry, it needs to happen actually at an individual level. And perhaps an education needs to happen at an individual level um, to ensure, you know, good data security practices are in place, you know, passwords to FA, biometric protections as where applicable um, and, and perhaps that education curve needs to happen because from from you know all the training I've received you know that sort of vulnerability is you know first and foremost um, before moving into the more sophisticated um, type of, of cyber attacks that could potentially happen um, so there's a, there's a few different steps and, and, and to be fair you know just you know training on an individual level seems rather mundane but perhaps it's actually the easiest way to, to instill the correct behaviors and, and give the best protection as is needed. A, a rather like a public health campaign that we've all experienced. I don't think we need to create any details on that, but if you had something equivalent, maybe not quite as overreaching, but something as equivalent when it comes to data protection and security on an individual level, um, that would help. Obviously for us as a cryptocurrency exchange, uh, security is at the paramount of, of, our, of our thinking. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, others in the industry are the same. Um, so you know, this is a subject very close to our hearts, but, um, but for us, when we talk to talk to um, our clients on the exchange and even ourselves, we're continuously sending out messaging, just trying to keep people alert to the potential concerns that they may have and the best practices that they can institute in their own daily routines and lives. But I'd be very interested actually, to hear what are the thoughts of the other panelists with regards to that. You know, do they think that that's a, a good step in terms of putting it down against that? good best practices at an individual level. Sarah? It always comes down to the individual. It's what we tell our customers constantly. You know, the weakest point in anything is the individual. It's where everything happens. So yeah, absolutely 100% agree, Caroline. And Meg, what's your take on the possibilities on this front, both in terms of cybersecurity protection and of course, responsibility? Yeah, there's so many different systems changing um, over in, in so many big ways. I find it really difficult to think of the, the second order impacts of some of these things. If there is, if you know, banks have been such a big institution for such a long time, if we would change it and we make it about trust, we make it open, there is no, there is no bank, there's no the central tangibility of it. Like I, I think we probably need um, anthropologists in the, in the room more than, than technologists to really think about that, that human psychology. But 
as the person in my family that has to reset everyone's printers, um, I, I know I know we we still have a long way to go. Uh, what I think is also interesting is reflecting uh, that I'm in my own very privileged bubble, and and we've got all of these things that for the for the first time ever, but still not in in enough depth. We've got to be thinking about billions of people, not just ourselves. So um, how do we how do we how do we help people in sub-Saharan Africa get out of poverty and also get more trust in um, in political systems as well as financial systems? Um, you know, it is it is incredibly incredibly complex. So, um, but I think you're, you're right that there is things we can do at a macro level. But at, at the end of the day, just actually open communication to individuals. But the fact that Australia loses millions and millions of dollars each year on on scams of um, that you that anyone is who's been around enough would know that's crazy, but it's it still works. So uh, it just talks about the complexity of these systems. And actually, I, I don't think there's a single answer to to all of them. We need to we need to battle them on 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 all fronts. Um, Caroline, a lot of the world has no access to financial services and I want to ask about the potential for people in emerging economies to be part of a, some sort of banking system that decentralised mm. finance can supply. Well, this is probably a, a question that's been tackled by traditional finance, by the fintech community and, then, and now decentralised finance or DeFi coming through. And probably again harks back to, to Nick's point about the need to um, to simplify and clarify so that when you're taking these kind of services into communities that have been outside the banking system for so long, um, that you that you meet people where you find them. If you want to bring them on this journey, you have to, as I say, meet people where you find them. And the, the point too is that just because the large communities have been outside of our traditional financial system for so long doesn't mean that they themselves haven't got their own networks that already exist and that probably more relevant for us to try and adapt our existing you know, technologies and solutions that we have or build technologies and solutions that reflect their own current and existing systems. But I do think that, um, that the use of something like decentralized finance, which would be available on your, on your mobile phone, we all know the, the, the scale of mobile phone adoption worldwide, but through your mobile phone, um, because of the fact that it can be fractionalized down to the nth degree with something like cryptocurrencies, um, it really opens up the, the possibility of a better exchange of value, an easier, quicker, and safer, uh, transparent transfer of value for, for people within, not just within those communities, but, but worldwide. And, and for myself here in Australia, sitting as we do in this developed first world country, sometimes you know, a lot of the arguments I hear about cryptocurrencies are, we, we don't need it, what's the point of it? But that's because exactly to the point of the privilege of where we sit and the experience we've had of the world and, and of the economy is that it works relatively for us. But when we talk to people who come from less developed countries or countries where they haven't got the same sense of financial stability, they really clearly see the use case of transferring their you know, nation and national currency into something like Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever whatever your poison is and, and transferring it around the world that way. So again, I suppose, I mean, that's probably the arguments that we're still you know, jostling with while we try and build up this, um, this community and this economy, this blockchain economy. But it's great that we're having these questions and it's great that we're having these discussions. But again, I suppose my earlier point, the, the people that we need to talk to are the people in these communities rather than those of us who've been uh, very fortunate to, to not face the same challenges. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go off planet uh, for a while because I want to think about space. We are in an extraordinary revolution at the moment in terms of the number of satellites that are going up. Some great Australian companies are involved and of course Elon Musk and SpaceX are involved in the Starlink satellites. So many opportunities there. This is a new frontier and it's only uh, in recent weeks that of course the UN has stepped in to sort of try and deal with the issue of militarization in space, preventing that happening. But as you mentioned earlier, Sarah, there's going to be a lot of stuff floating up around there. And I know we're already starting to find a few problems emerging. Give us your picture of how you think space will look 10 years from now. I mean, beyond sort of exploring the outer reaches of it, just above our Earth. Yeah, and you've absolutely hit on it, Simon. That is the biggest problem we're facing. And you've talked about some of the collisions we've already seen. So you think about the thousands upon thousands of satellites being launched and the finite life they have and the cost of getting them back into, um, you know, back onto Earth. So 
you know, I, I don't know if it's 10 years in the future, I have this great vision of my son becoming a space cowboy and being out there doing space salvage. Um, you know, one of the big challenges is that there isn't, there isn't control or regulation around space at this point in time. You know, is space considered to be a, one of the global commons like the Antarctic? Um, and therefore, who regulates the use of space or who has access to it? And how do we create that safe and sustainable use of space? Um, so I, if I want to be a little bit you know, controversial, I think maybe we're going to see space salvage, like maritime salvage. I get there first, I get to own it, I can bring it back to Earth and do what I want with it. You might see space piracy or squatters rights becoming a thing, um, because that's going to be the biggest challenge is how do we get all of that debris either from collisions or just from, you know, satellites and things that have reached the end of their life back to Earth. Now, on that front too, of course, the other thing that's happening is the Internet of Things. And I want to ask all of the panel, how much do you think IoT will transform the way we exist, the way we operate, the way we think? And then let's layer over the top of that the emergence of quantum computing so that we go from this space of almost this omnis niscient ability to compute rather than sort of the linear way we currently do. Professor Young. Well, Simon, you, you're really pushing us for a Thursday morning uh, with only one coffee in my bloodstream. Um, I, I was really struck when Sarah was talking about all those things about space, that we are we're applying all the, the things that, that have built humanity to the point we are now in terms of, and you mentioned military, uh, uh, ownership, throwing things out there without thought of that it's actually, even though it's kind of in, infinite, that it's not a connect filled up. Um, it's for our own use. We don't think of the long-term impacts. We think of short-term impacts. Um, so I was, I was really struck by that and think it's interesting that we're, we still haven't obviously evolved to the next level of thinking of apply, apply that, that problem, the, the a new models to, um, to the, our current situation. Um, but I think things like quantum computing are absolutely going to change things. And, and it's just impossible to, to completely predict because, again, the second order impacts on how they can change daily behaviour uh, is uh, is going to be is going to be amazing. I don't think we'll even notice computers now, like we in every single device that they're all communicating to each other. Uh, and, and it's really useful to think of practical examples of like uh, autonomous vehicles, the how much safer it is to drive when every car can actually just talk to each other rather than the humans looking around. Um, but uh, I think there's uh, I'm very I'm hopeful that we actually take that as a uh, as a cue to be more in touch with nature, more offline, more in touch with people and, and spending time together. Uh, because if I think we are, you know, already player one mode of the world where we've, we've all got headphone um, headsets on and plugged into the metaverse um, that I'd be pretty, pretty sad about that. So I'm I'm hoping for more poetry. I'll put, I'll, I'll leave there my comment there. I like that. Uh, Carolyn, I do want to ask you, how much potential does quantum promise for blockchain and cryptocurrencies? Uh, for me, well, um, well, from my point of view, with quantum computing, it's been spoken, it's been spoken about as being the blockchain buster, that, uh, that the power that it has, the ability that it has to, to break through the, the, the crypto keys that makes blockchain so safe. And I was actually doing a bit of reading around it, you know, the, the, the course of my job. And the answer to fight quantum seems to be quantum. And uh, and there are greater minds than mine, far brighter than mine, that are working on that problem. Technology is never anything to be afraid of. It's always what, what we do with it when it's the hands of the humans. That, that's where the problem lies. And it probably goes back, as again, to kind of Nick's point earlier. It, it, it's around how society interacts and how society changes with it. And, and how the, our culture impacts upon it. Um, so it's a really fascinating question, but I probably would defer more to the professor on this one. He probably knows an awful lot more about quantum computing than I do. <laughs> Young, how are we going to be tracking over the next decade when it comes to quantum technologies? Um, the, the technologies such as quantum computing and the Internet of Things will continue uh, developing. So I think that we, we are on the track of getting the new technologies which, which makes uh, uh, our uh, human society uh, better than before. So I think uh, both Sarah and Mick raised a very important issue, which is how we actually uh, use the uh, technologies uh, responsibly uh, and also how we can keep sustainability as an important issue. So remember that uh, uh, maybe a hundred years ago uh, when we uh, got uh, plastic, 
we, we, we use this material. This is a fantastic material, right? But now th this is a huge environmental issue, right? So um, same as a blockchain, we, we, we can see the value of blockchain, which is uh, providing a trustable um, platform for everyone. However, currently it has an issue about uh, energy consumption. And probably it, it could be the same as the satellite uh, technologies and also the quantum computing technologies as well. So uh, we, we probably need to think a little bit more than the technology, how we, we actually use the technology once the te technologies are available to us. So now um, the quantum computing is uh, on its uh, early stage. It can do some, some work, but uh, it, it hasn't uh, got its uh, full power yet. Uh, once we got that, uh, at that point, the quantum computing can provide um, significantly improve the computing power. What we should do, how we can harness the power of quantum computing. I guess that is a, a important uh, question for everyone. So um, we, we need to think about um, um, what if the hackers use quantum computing to break your system and uh, crack your um, crypto system and uh, crack your, your password. And they can easily get into your computer and steal your information. So um, I guess at this stage, we need to think about what if the technology is available? What should we do? Sarah, do you get a sense that this could happen within the next decade or it will be a little bit further down the track? I feel like it's going to be a little bit further down the track. So we'll have quantum computing in the next decade. I don't doubt that. It's just how extensive it's going to be. And I think you, know, you can see it emerging already around governments who are really focused on trying to you know, get there first. And um, we've seen China make some announcements in this space. We've seen um, a big interest out of defense and intelligence agencies for the reasons that the professor has just talked to, which is you know, quantum cryptography is going to be a job of the future. Um, is you know, how do we stop the hackers in their tracks before they have quantum computing? And so I think we're probably going to see some non-proliferation you know, agreements perhaps emerging, a bit like you know, nuclear or atomic non-proliferation, non um, but quantum non-proliferation treaties emerging um, because it is so powerful and there are so many things that could be done with it and we don't know the extent of it yet or how it could exactly be used. Now, Mick, I want you to cast your mind back and then think forward 100 years. Uh, a century ago, of course, there was the Great Depression in the 1930s. Governments rationed food and taught people how to grow food at home. In 2030, let's imagine that everyone has a carbon ration to deal with emissions reduction. People are allocated 100 kilograms of emissions a week. And once you use those, can't do anything else. How do you see the role of technology in allocating how they use it and also the role of technology in food production? Let's say we do all start growing our food at home. I think we have been doing that in the last uh, couple of years and as the pandemic hit us and we had a sense that there might be some scarcity. Where does technology play its role on that front? Yeah, I certainly hope that we uh, either can create such amazing progress with sustainability and and cheap renewable energy that um, that carbon is uh, something we eventually get to, we're able to take um, out of the environment in, in really positive ways. Uh, I think food will be will be a challenge. Um, my, my good friend, Phil Moore is working to try to work out how to feed 10 billion people. I'm not even sure that with, um, with the climate anxiety, with pandemics, um, that, we're, that we're gonna get to that. I think we'll have a re reduction in population growth Regards of that, uh, I noticed that our um, we we consume more resources by the end of July to, than the Earth um, can actually reproduce for us. So we spend the rest of it getting into debt. Um, so we've still got a massive massive way to go. Uh, I, I I think it's interesting thinking back a hundred years and then forward. That you're giving me whiplash again, Simon. But um, back to can we can we keep the complexity we have with systems of, of quantum computing? Uh, and all the things Sarah was just talking about that interact and work together. Um, but, and then can we also simplify? Can we go back to growing our own vegetables and just like putting a seed in the ground with some um, good soil and water and sunshine? And, and hopefully we can get to a better balance of that because we do also underestimate 
like I think Yang mentioned in terms of plastics, we're like, this is great. And then we just take it to the, to the degree we're not really good at moderation and we're not really good at thinking about long-term consequences. So well, look, I, I think actually we have um, hopefully been wisened up early enough to these big uh, existential problems like the climate. I don't think we've thought enough about equality, gender, diversity, uh, inclusion, et cetera. Um, we've got more work to do on all, all those fronts. Um, I, for me, it does come back to the princi principles of, of leaders. And I think that's what possibly the, the scariest thing. It goes back to your starting point about um, a robot being elected president in the US. Uh, like the strength of principle and leadership and actual leadership in leadership, uh, I think is one of the one of the biggest challenges because that's a system that hasn't actually been just dis disrupted. Um, but and I still think that actually individuals can influence that more than we think in terms of uh, voting and, and influence. So I've completely dodged your question based on the, the, the complexity, not wishing to put too much out there. But um, again, I, I hope it's a moot point that we were just looking after the environment amazingly and growing our own veggies. Uh, but I, I think it's uh, all these systems are, are interacting. We, we need leadership at every single level, including an individual. Well, Mick, you mentioned a little bit earlier going outside to smell the roses and we're, we need to wrap shortly, but I'm going to leave my panel with just a couple of quick questions. The first one is, do you think in 2030 we can have an offline life? Mick? I definitely, I definitely hope so. Like I, I, there's so much I love about um, getting back in touch with nature, whether it's being in the ocean. And again, I'm wonderfully privileged to be in an area where I'm 500 meters from green spaces and 10 minutes from from the beach and oceans. But um, I, I, I really hope we can use these things to not watch um, more cat videos, but to actually spend more time off offline. So I just think we need to, we need a bit of a shake up of that. Uh, but it's it's hard. Like it's 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 easy to pick up your phone and look at the next notification and to check your inbox. But that's not, again, that's not leadership. Um, and it's uh, I, I don't know exactly how we do that other than a, a, a movement that with people actually taking individual decisions. But I, I, we we need to. Uh, otherwise, I think it's going it's going to a, a, a negative singularity moment. So. Sarah, I don't know if you saw the uh, Metaverse parody that Iceland's tourism organisation did with the Icelandverse, but do you believe that we could go off grid? We could have a not connected life and still exist and function in society in 10 years from now? I think in 10 years, yes. I, I hold the same hope that Mick does. Um, but I feel like it, it may be that sort of split that you've got 50% of the people who are completely connected all the time, plugged into their metaverse, and that's the way they live. And they have you know, their little drones that are delivering their food or the robots that are cleaning the house. Um, and then you're going to have those people who make that conscious decision to unplug. And we see it already that people choose to opt out of social media. They choose to opt out of these connected lives and actually live off the grid. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna. It is. It will be an option. It's just to the extent within society we see it happening. Caroline, your view. Caroline, are you there? Or Yang, would you like to? What do you think? Will you be off grid somewhere down the track, writing another book? Y yes, uh, that's also my hope. I, I actually once. Um, went to uh, Fiji and stayed in a small island and uh, totally off uh, internet for a week. And I, I, my feeling was, was just a fantastic how, how life could be so beautiful there. <laughs> so so that, that's my hope. But I guess uh, in here um, uh, also technologies can help um, incentivize people to do so, to have a better life. For example, um, a blockchain can be used for uh, carbon trading. So uh, if everything can be tokenized, then we can use the technology to uh, motivate people to have a better life. So I guess um, uh, one side, uh, we shouldn't overuse the technology and the other side, we can probably um, use the technologies to in improve our life. So uh, I think I'm optimistic and uh, I believe uh, technology could be used for better life. 
All right, my final question, and I'm going to stay with you, Young, is a Silicon Valley billionaire has moved to New Zealand and decided to boost local the tourism industry by creating the Museum of NFTs. It's a dual online and in-person experience to rival the Tate Modern, the Guggenheim, the Louvre, and crowds are flocking to it to marvel at the treasures. There is, of course, Jack Dorsey's first tweet and Elon Musk's first words of coding. So imagine you're the curator of the Museum of NFTs. What would you put in it and why? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I guess uh, uh, in, 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 in general, uh, I would see uh, how people and technology can uh, work together or, or uh, evolve together. So um, we can have something online and we can have something offline. Um, but uh, essentially, we should have a better life, right? So it could be a combination of human and a technology, or it could be a, a technology assistant, a better life. So um, what I would see is that um, um, if we, we build something, uh, we, we, we could have some uh, technology enabled something, uh, and uh, it could be digital transport, transformed something and it could be some uh, better better things than the traditional things. Mick, have you got a, something specific? Is there a surfboard NFT that uh, you'd like to see in there? I'm going to go completely selfish and uh, put in my own, uh, the rainbow that I did in preschool for my mum. Um, and look, at the colours were out of order, but that's just my creativity. So uh, I'll, I'll bring it back to education and looking after our mums. Mick, shut up and take my Ethereum right now. Sarah? That was a great answer. Actually, what I want to see is some Aboriginal art. I want to see native art being brought forward in this way. It's such a great opportunity for NFTs and for the artists. So why not that or the Beeple piece that sold for $69 million at Christie's? Everybody wants to see that. So That would be a bit of fun. And I know that Caroline, who unfortunately has dropped out, did want to put the Irish win at the Rugby World Cup in there. Thank you so much to my incredible panellists today on our Microthetical. Really appreciate your time, your insights, your cleverness. It's such an amazing possibility over the next decade and we really appreciate it. Young, Mick, Caroline, Sarah, thank you much, so much for joining us. Thank you so much also to Microsoft for partnering with us on this Microthetical. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you will be able to watch this a little later on the startupdaily.net website. Hope you have a great day. We'll see you in 10 years from now. Bye for now.